Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just back from break for anyone who's joining us once again uh, virtually. So hopefully everyone's managed to stay online. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a, a, a nice snack. Um, we are going to begin our second session. Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. Trevor Hamilton to, to come up. And he's going to be speaking to the role of HIPEC in gastric cancer treatment. And Dr. Hamilton is from Vancouver. He completed his medical school at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and general surgery training at the University of Calgary. And he has a long list of things he's done. Um, it's in our program and, and it's also online. So I just wanna welcome Dr. Trevor Hamilton. Thank you. I'm going to bring this forward. Uh, thank you, Teresa, and uh, thank you both, Teresa and Katie, for uh, giving me the opportunity, the invitation to speak with you here today. Um, I think what they've done and started at My Gut Feeling is a, is a really important endeavor, and I really applaud them for all the work that they've put into. I know personally, within my practice, I have a number of patients with gastric cancer, and this is actually a resource that I steer them towards to potentially give them you know, answers that I'm not able to give them, or even to give them the opportunity to look things up uh, at their own leisure, because sometimes when I'm discussing things in clinic, it might not be the best time, or they might not have all that uh, types of questions formulated and this is a sort of an online resource and, and even more than that uh, that they can access so I think it's really invaluable so hopefully I can figure this out here um, just which button the center Not this one okay should be easy um, I don't know it doesn't seem to be uh, advancing Um, and I have my water here. I am just recovering from a bit of a cold, so I apologize if I sound a bit stuffed up, and hopefully it doesn't impair uh, my presentation. Was I pressing the wrong button? Oh, that one. Okay, good. Okay, so I have no specific conflicts of interest. Um, we're talking about a topic that is quite controversial, and uh, I think it's important to recognize uh, who's actually talking to you about this. And uh, we have to keep in mind that we all bring our own biases and opinions into something. So I wanted to tell you who, a little bit who I am. I'm a surgical oncologist, and it, pretty much all, all I treat are advanced gastrointestinal intra-abdominal cancers. My main focus is on gastro cancer, but also in recurrent and metastatic colorectal cancer. I am the co-lead for the British Columbia Peritoneal Malignancy Program. So there's two of us who perform cytoreductive surgeries in HIPEC in British Columbia. And between the two of us, we treat all of those patients. I'm also the chair of the BC Cancer Gastrointestinal Surgical Tumor Group, which focuses on quality initiatives, uh, improvements for gastric cancer patients specifically. So if you just Google gastro cancer HIPEC, you might actually find a lot of interesting information. You might find a lot of research articles, but you also might see things like these, these big headlines that say, adding HIPEC to cytoreductive surgery improves survival in gastro cancer, or improved overall survival with HIPEC. Um, new study, Netherlands looking at HIPEC treatment in gastro cancer and imp improved survival with peritoneal metastasis. You might say, well, it seems pretty clear to me from what I've read that this is something that should be improving patients' uh, survival and care. However, as I mentioned, it's very, very controversial. And if you ask 10 different surgical oncologists that treat gastro cancer about this, you might get 10 very different opinions. Um, and oftentimes when we're differing opinions in medicine, it's, it's because we haven't seen data that's convincing in either direction necessarily. Um, important to keep that in mind. The objectives I want to talk about today is just a bit of an introduction on gastro cancer spread and metastases, uh, review the uh, treatment strategies or concepts in HIPEC, because there's different strategies, uh, and then some of the current and ongoing research and trials. So very, very basic. Here's your stomach. 
Uh, stomach cancer has, can be a very aggressive cancer, as I'm sure everybody knows, um, and it can spread to different places, and that can mean different things. And one of the very common places it can spread to are the lymph nodes or the glands that surround the stomach, uh, and that can basically tells us that the gastric cancer is behaving more aggressively. It's got that ability to spread to other places. That often impacts our treatment decisions. In addition, it can spread through the bloodstream, end up in common places like the liver or the lungs, um, which again impacts our treatment decisions. Finally, it can spread through the peritoneum, and the peritoneum is essentially this lining on the inside of the abdomen and the pelvis, that connective tissue lining that sort of regulates flow of fluids and things, and it's a protective barrier for us, and it's really on all the surfaces in the abdomen, so it's a very large surface area. And gastric cancer can spread and has a high tendency to spread to the peritoneum, and I really want to focus the talk today just, just on that, okay? Um, if we think about a gastric cancer, it often starts at this very early phase, which is on the most superficial layer of the inside wall of the stomach. And as it grows, it sort of grows deeper and through the layers of the stomach wall. And this is how we sort of do our T-staging or tell us how sort of thick or how deep through the layers the st stomach cancer behaves. And from a theoretical perspective, we think that uh, cancers that are thicker through the wall and potentially going through all the layers of the wall are at a higher likelihood of shedding some of these cancer cells on the outside surface of the stomach. And these cells can then land on other surfaces in the abdomen and then grow new cancer cells and new cancer nodules or deposits of cancer. Um, so although we think uh, T3 and T4 cancers have a much higher risk. Theoretically, any of these are at risk, and we, we do see it happen sometimes in T1s and even T2 cancers. I think it's important to know we talk about stage all the time. Physicians will, will very frequently talk about stage, and that's what, how advanced the cancer is at when you're diagnosed. And we use that again to try and determine what are the best strategies in order to treat patients and give a perspective of what kind of survival we think might, patients might have. So it's, it, in all cancers, it goes from stage one to stage four, one being the earliest, four being the most advanced. And when there are peritoneal metastases found at the diagnosis, that is by definition distant spread of disease, and we consider that stage four. Specifically in gastro cancer, we also talk about the fluid that is in the abdominal cavity. And sometimes this fluid can have microscopic little cell clusters that are stomach cancer cells that have come outside the stomach but haven't manifested into any sort of obvious tumor that we can appreciate. In stomach cancer, we've known over decades that that presence is actually uh, um, has survival outcomes very similar, if not equivalent, to if there is actually gross disease there. And so both of those types of presentations are consistent with stage four or metastatic disease. Um, it highlights the importance of the diagnostic laparoscopy, which is done fairly routinely in advanced gastric cancers, because these types of findings are often not seen on CT scans unless it's more obvious. Um, I did want to mention very importantly um, about treatment options in the setting of metastatic disease. Uh, generally speaking, uh, metastatic disease is, if you read all the guidelines from internationally everywhere, is treated with systemic chemotherapy. That's the, usually the IV or other types of chemotherapy um, for those that are sort of strong enough and robust enough to tolerate it. And for those that are not, often it's best supportive care. And that is the standard to which we currently have and that we've seen the best long-term outcomes for. So everything else that we're talking about is fairly experimental or theoretical, okay? There are some limitations to chemotherapy, specifically for metastases in the peritoneum as opposed to, let's say, liver or lung metastases. Um, the theory is that the penetration uh, through the peritoneal lining, which is a protective barrier, as I said, is potentially not as good with systemic chemotherapy. So even though the, can the chemotherapy drugs are traveling through your bloodstream, they don't necessarily penetrate the peritoneum as well. Um, and traditionally, we've seen lower response rates than, let's say, compared to liver or lung metastasis. Uh, but it's something that it can be challenging to measure. In terms of historically, uh, this is treated as a, as a fairly uh, poor prognosis. Patients are usually given months to live, um, and it's generally considered incurable. Um, 
Cytoreductive surgery, which is the gross removal of all the cancer deposits within the abdomen, uh, as well as this intraperitoneal chemotherapy, was initially described in the early 1980s and then sort of championed and pioneered mostly in appendix cancer as an aggressive treatment to remove all the cancer burden and also introduce a localized or regionalized chemotherapy treatment to attack where it's been harder to attack uh, cancer cells in the past. And that sort of was like a a single package treatment, uh, mostly delivered in appendix cancer originally to looking at uh, improved survival outcomes. Um, however, it was uh, first, they had the first description of intraperitoneal chemotherapy in Japan specifically for gastric cancer, uh, and they introduced chemotherapy after they had done a planned curative intense stomach cancer surgery. Um, and they did demonstrate some improved survival with few recurrences, but this was a very small trial, and it was quite a long time ago, and a lot of the treatment strategies have changed since that time. Really, I've mentioned HIPEC a few times and I haven't really defined it, which you're not really supposed to do in a presentation. Um, but I'm coming back to it now because I thought it lent itself better. HIPEC is just an acronym uh, and it stands for Hyperthermic Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy. So I didn't invent this acronym, but that's how they make it work in terms of the capital letters, okay? Um, so, well, how does it work, you might ask? Um, essentially what happens is chemotherapy is delivered all the, through potentially different routes um, to the inside of the abdomen and it has a penetration that's actually quite thin. It's only about, it's, it's designed to only penetrate about two to three millimeters deep um, through the peritoneal lining. Um, and the advantage of, of that peritoneal barrier being in there is that there's actually fairly limited systemic absorption, so limited uh, of that chemotherapy going out and being absorbed in your bloodstream which has an advantage because then we can actually deliver much higher concentrations of chemotherapy, sometimes 20 times higher than a normal dose you might deliver through an IV route. Um, and the theory is that that can be more cancer killing on a cellular level with a one time or number of times dosing. Um, the hyperthermia that is often delivered um, is supposed to have a synergistic effect or something that helps improve the efficiency of the cancer killing properties that the chemotherapy has. So in terms of going through the literature, there's really three areas of research that people are looking at, and they're looking at very, very different things. So it's a, HIPEC is, is kind of a coverall term, but there are very different types of cancer stages and patient stages uh, in which to potentially look at for avenues of research. And the first one I want to talk about is true peritoneal metastases. Um, before I delve into that, I just want to mention briefly the peritoneal carcinomatosis or cancer index, which is... In, in literature all the time is as a way of trying to objectively evaluate the amount of cancer that's within an abdomen, okay? Uh, without going into it, there's actually 13 different uh, regions in the body that are evaluated, and the score goes between zero and three for all those regions. So if you sum it up, you can have a score anywhere from zero to 39. 39 is very extensive disease occupying all surfaces of the abdomen, whereas a score of zero is truly zero. Um, when we talk about this type of treatment for gastric cancer, numerous, numerous studies have really talked about very limited extent of disease in the abdomen. So very small number PCI, usually in single digit or even low single digit. So that's important to mention and understand, okay? Um, this is probably the most uh, well-recognized and published study up to date at this point in time looking at treating gastric cancer patients with peritoneal metastasis. This is the French group which have been doing cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC for decades now uh, for a number of different types of cancers. Uh, and this is their collaborative group. And they published a study, came out really last year or earlier this year, um, which had almost 300 patients, 277, treated over 25 years at very specialized centers that only do this type of treatment. Um, and they reported some improved survival. So about 18 months, a year and a half survival on average versus 12 months with still a type of surgical therapy to remove all the cancer, but not delivering the chemotherapy element. And the you know, conclusions from the authors were that giving this chemotherapy treatment actually started to improve in a term of six months, the long-term survival it's really important to take home a couple messages from this study. Number one is they had not even 300 patients over almost three decades. This is highly, highly selective. 
They are picking out patients out of thousands and thousands and thousands of people that come in and only picking out a handful. So, and they had very, very low volume disease. PCI of three, as, as a peritoneal surgeon, is very uncommon. We don't usually encounter very often, and particularly in gastric cancer, not commonly uh, identified, okay? Um, what they, I didn't write on the slide here, um, but what was important is they also have some associated morbidity and mortality. So this is a big treatment to go through. Um, they reported that over half of the patients receiving any form of surgical treatment had a major complication, meaning going to the ICU, going back to the operating room, requiring interventional radiology procedures, long hospital stays. And they actually reported 7 to 10% of patients uh, actually had a mortality or died within 90 days of this procedure, which they considered uh, you know, acceptable, but most of us would consider very, very high. When we think about other types of surgical procedures we do in advanced cancers, that's very high. They're very honest in, in their data, which is important. Uh, we had talks earlier today about the importance of reporting the appropriate outcomes, and these would be very important to discuss, especially when we're talking about these treatments. Um, this was a, as a Chinese study, which is a true randomized trial, um, looking, or the previous study was not a randomized trial, it was an observational trial, um, actually looking at patients who had resection for their metastatic gastric cancer and then had chemotherapy on the inside or not. So they had HIPAC versus not. And they saw the patients that had the HIPAC did have an improved survival, but a big take-home message again is the survival is not good in general. Averages survivals being from six to 11 months. Um, and what I'll get to in a second is this is really not much better or act even potentially worse than what we see in just getting chemotherapy alone, okay? Um, so it may improve some survival if we add the high pec, but um, you know, are they, are they getting the survival benefit that we're really looking for? They actually did not report their mortality data in this study, which would be very disappointing because we want to see that kind of information. Um, this is just to get at a different randomized trial, which is um, uh, discussed, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, and they were looking at, it's not a HIPEC study specifically, but it's looking at doing surgery in metastatic gastric cancer, which generally speaking, we don't recommend, okay? Um, and they were, there was some theory at the time that saying removing the primary tumor in the stomach might actually improve the survival, and this study certainly did not find that. What they found that is that doing surgery, if anything, might have actually had worse survival, and they closed this study early due to the ethical, the ethical concerns of continuing it going, that people who were just getting chemotherapy actually were going to do better than if they had surgery and chemotherapy. So um, important study to think about, truly randomized, very well done study, okay? Um, there are a number of trials uh, looking at this. Um, these are not an exhaustive list, it's just a couple of trials that are ongoing. The first one is a, a Chinese uh, study where again, they have more gastric cancer patients in China than like the rest, it's half the gastric cancer in the, in the world are in China, so um, they have potentially for a number of trials there. Um, they're looking at this type of treatment uh, as a, a, a non-comparative. It's a phase two study, so they're not randomizing anyone. This second study is out of Germany, and they're looking at doing, in a Western population, which is good for us to find out, um, resections plus or minus high pack. So similar to some of the other data I just showed, but in a true Western population. And the third study is probably the study that I'm most interested in. Um, it's coming out of the Netherlands, and they're actually randomizing patients to getting chemotherapy alone versus getting surgery plus, chemo, plus the intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which is probably the question we want to answer the most, is that does this treatment do better than if you just had chemotherapy, which has not been clearly answered in the literature to this date, in my opinion. So that might be something for the future. Next, talking about HIPEC for positive cytology. And I mentioned this is still stage four disease, and generally speaking, we do not operate on this population. Um, there, have been a, there are a couple of trials that are out there right now. These are pretty much the only ones trying to address this. This first one is, a, is the same sort of French group looking at not just patients with positive cytology, but also with locally advanced tumors, so non-metastatic, maybe stage three disease and giving them surgery, but then in addition doing HIPEC. So in this scenario, they're not removing any cancer nodules in the abdomen because they're not there yet. 
but they think that they're very high risk of developing them. And doing this chemotherapy is a, as a preventative strategy or what we call adjuvant strategy. Um, that's, that study's in France. And then this other study um, uh, is actually in the US, looking at patients with cytology positive disease and treating them in the same way. This is a non-randomized study, really just looking at feasibility of a small number of patients, okay? Um, and then finally kind of getting to the high, high PEC as adjuvant. It's, it's not a new concept. It's actually been out there since 1988, like I mentioned. Um, the reason it hasn't been uniformly adopted is there's been conflicting results. These are a number of different either perspective or randomized trial looking at it, saying sometimes seeing a benefit, sometimes not. When we see that in medicine, sometimes we do these uh, meta-analysis, which is like an analysis of numerous trials to see if there's a difference. And in some of those studies, they're saying maybe there's a slight benefit, um, but hard to know yet. Pretty much all these studies have been done in Asia, um, which uh, some people have concerns about translating those same results to Western patients. Mostly because if you look at the dates of these studies, I mean, our, our chemotherapy treatments have changed a lot in the past few decades. And as well, we use a lot more preoperative chemotherapy in Western countries as opposed to Asia, where they often give the chemotherapy afterwards. So just um, important, important to know in terms of going forward. Um, some of the limitations about what's out there in the, in the literature um, is that many, pretty much the emphasis on all these studies is on survival, but very f uh, few of them are even completely reporting their complications as, as well their perioperative mortality, which as a patient, if you're signing up for a treatment and you don't know what the expected, like, am I going to be alive in 30 to 60 days after surgery, you know, you probably really want to know that kind of information. If it's going to be 10% people die, that's a pretty important number that you want to know about. But, and, and again, echoing my colleague earlier, uh, who really was trying to advocate for quality of life and patient reported outcomes, very few of them have. Now, some of the emerging randomized trial are, are incorporating things like that, but out there right now, very limited, limited information. And for patients signing up again for uh, in a very aggressive type of treatment that can be quite morbid, I think it would be important for us to know about that. Also very important to know that this is uh, for a very select few patients, realistically, um, and, and it's, it's likely not to benefit most patients. I did want to reiterate the current standard for people with locally advanced or advanced gastric cancer, um, which in Western countries we generally recommend preoperative chemotherapy if possible, not all the time it's possible, uh, followed by gastrectomy with an ex uh, extended lymphadenectomy, and then followed by uh, chemotherapy afterwards. It's a bit different recommendations for early stage gastric cancer, but I'm not gonna uh, mention that today. So on a like, at home level, like what's available in Canada, there are no registered active clinical trials for the treatment of this in gastric cancer right now, um, unless there's something I don't know about, which I think is unlikely. Um, there are select centers that may offer this on a highly select cases um, in certain situations. Um, but it's really case by case, um, and it would be center dependent. Um, as for our center in BC, we do not offer this treatment for people with peritoneal metastasis from gastric cancer. We don't, we don't offer it for any of those stages that I outlined earlier in gastric cancer based on the current evidence. Uh, we don't think it's, it's currently justified, okay? Um, just so you know, these are the number of, of HIPEC centers that are in Canada that are currently treating a number of different peritoneal malignancies, um, generally at gastrointestinal malignancies. So in conclusion, um, peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer are really challenging to treat for all healthcare providers, and they're challenging to manage on a patient level, certainly. Um, numerous trials are evaluating this, so we probably will see the uh, evidence continue to evolve in the future. Um, and little evidence to support uh, this outside of a clinical trial in gastric cancer um, or in a very highly selected scenario. Thanks. Hi, um, I may have missed this, but um, in Korea and in Japan, do they have this, what we don't have in Canada? 
That's a good question. Um, so do they have this uh, as, as questioning to hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy? Yes, this is available in, in numerous countries throughout the world. Um, certainly in Korea and Japan and other East Asian countries, there are a number, I didn't go into all of them, um, there are a number of centers looking at this on an individual basis. At the current time, what's out there in literature is a center might have offhand few cases here or there that they've done over a decade or two, and they might pool that data and then present it as to what their current outcomes are. Um, so there's a lot of handful of studies looking at small numbers. Um, and you know, they do these types of treatments in those countries for other malignancies like appendix cancers and colon cancers and things. So it's definitely available, but in terms of anyone standardizing, you know, what the exact indications are, and um, it, it's just, it has, we're not there yet. And the exact modalities, like the exact, you know, chemotherapy dosage and regimens, just, it's, it's still very uh, experimental, I guess would be a one word, or investigational. So, so my question is, uh, thank you, doctor, for an excellent presentation. My question is, uh, first is, is, is the centers in, in, in Canada, is that because we don't have so many patients, so the population is, is not big enough to, to, to conduct this type of study? That's my first question. And the second question is, is the chemo, uh, you know, the combination of drugs, is it the same when you do, you know, uh, an, an, a normal kind of chemo? And is that, is that how you, you compare those? results, normal chemo, whether injecting it into the peritoneum? Yeah, two good questions. Um, there are a number of centers. Uh, it's a small group of us that do this type of treatment. So, and we, to be honest, we all know each other in this country. So is there a, uh, an avenue to potentially do a clinical trial? There is. Um, the logistics of that can start to get a little complicated. Um, in terms of like patients in my practice that like I've seen that potentially could have this, it's a very small number. And so realistically, if you wanted to have a clinical trial, you probably want the whole country involved in order to even get very small numbers of patients that we think might benefit. So that's probably one of the limitations to doing a clinical trial. In terms of the chemotherapy that's delivered, the chemotherapy that's delivered from an intraperitoneal perspective has to have very specific pharmacokinetics. And so it's not the same stuff that you often get through the IV. There's, there's similarities. Um, uh, and we have a number of different regimens that are seen in colon and appendix and other, and other ones. One of the problems with this treatment is that it, it has not been standardized. And even in some of those other diseases, the dosing, the timing, uh, the specific agent has not standardized. And in looking at all those studies that I presented, all of them had different agents and regimens. And so it would be nice to get that, but we're, we're just not there yet. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I know this is a very hot topic, and I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, Dr. Hamilton will be joining our sac second panel uh, to take more questions and discuss uh, surgical uh, treatment options for gastric cancer further, okay? Uh, I'd like to invite our next uh, speaker. So uh, her name is Anita Chinoy, and she's actually our caregiver speaker. Uh, we met uh, her this year, but uh, really she's a lady with just one of the biggest hearts and smiles that we've met all year. So please give it up for uh, Anita Shinoy. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, uh, Teresa, for asking me to speak today. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that this is only one caretaker's story. Um, I don't want to speak for all the caretakers because our journeys are all different. Um, I also am not speaking for my sister's journey. Um, I think it's important. I'm the eldest, she was the youngest. Um, I think it's important to um, not speak for her journey because I don't know what her journey was specifically. So I can only speak from my point of view. Um, my sister Lauren was extremely kind and generous. She loved being around people and participating in parties and eating lots of good food. Uh, this was her nature, which is why on a family trip to India for a wedding, 
we found it strange that Lauren couldn't keep any food down and preferred to be in her room sleeping as opposed to amongst the other guests. Uh, we stayed in India for a week um, and I tried to block it out of my mind and focus on the wedding, but I knew deep down that something was wrong. My cousins are both doctors, um, and one of them, a general internist, advised that if Lauren's symptoms and her nausea had not ceased by the time we got home, then Lauren should go to the hospital. Being an American, my cousin is an American, he said that my he was sure that this would be the best course of action because in Canada, we at least had a better system of healthcare that could address Lauren's symptoms. Um, and as I work for a cancer-related foundation, I knew that cancer could be a possibility. I couldn't immediately resign myself to this diagnosis because there was no diagnosis yet. So when Lauren went to the hospital and they discharged her within the same day after she was hydrated, I started to Google her symptoms. I told my siblings that the best case scenario was that she had H. pylori. Uh, the second best case scenario was that it was an ulcer. Um, and the worst case was that it was cancer. With the worst case, we could have to see what the cancer had been staged at. Um, this was on July 2nd. On July 3rd, Lauren went back to the hospital and a gastroendoscopy was performed with a biopsy of the tissue. Lauren's torso and body begin to fill with fluid, um, like the film image that I have of Violet Beauregard in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, and what a lot of the speakers have spoken to is the fluid contain an ascites or cancer cells. Uh, during this time, in an effort to cope, I told myself that it had to be something other than cancer. No one in my immediate family was diagnosed with cancer. My grandfather lived until 101, so clearly my youngest sibling could not have cancer. I had statistics and research on my side, so there was no way Lauren could have cancer. Um, on July 13th, in one of the few instances where no one was in her room, the gastroenterologist came into Lauren's room and advised that they had found cancer, that she had cancer. Lauren was in shock and called my parents, and then my sister Tanya called me and I came to my parents' house and I was in shock as well. But I know that cancer is a very real threat and genetics is just one component, so I was ready to start my journey with Lauren. Unfortunately, through my work, I had spoken to many families with young children who were diagnosed with cancer, so I had some sort of experience with the disease. Um, I spoke to my friend, a leading oncology nurse, who prepared me for this journey. She advised me that the person with cancer can feel your stress, your anxiety, your sadness, and anger. So it is best to try to be as normal as possible, as possible while in the hospital room. It took every ounce of strength I had to be calm and composed in Lauren's room to speak to her as if nothing was wrong. I feel guilty admitting that I got a lot of strength from Lauren, as whenever I would question my own pain, I would look to her and I would witness uh, Lauren's physical pain and see how she was maintaining her composure. I'm sure Lauren was emotionally distraught as well, but I never gave up hope, which I think is important. From my observation, the human brain is very powerful. And if you can somehow convince yourself of survival, even as cancer is trying to adapt and grow in your body, you can overcome insurmountable odds. The Oakville Hospital did not have the resources to treat Lauren's cancer. It was a cancer that was in the lining of Lauren's stomach, um, and as um, 
um, Melissa said earlier, that's diffuse, and it was spreading in the fluid that was filling her body. Lauren was very uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable, and the medical professional saw no reason to continue to tap or drain the fluid out of Lauren if it was just going to come back. It was at this time that another part of me started to kick in, and that was the fighter. Um, I couldn't let my sister die at 28 years of age, and I couldn't give up hope. Uh, I begged my employer, a big donor to Princess Margaret Cancer Center, to please ask for their expertise. Dr. Eric Chen heard this request and was surprised to hear of this case. He drove from Princess Margaret Cancer Center to the Oakville Hospital to see it for himself and to speak to Lauren and our family. He explained that Lauren had stage four metastatic diffuse gastric cancer that was inoperable based on the location of the cancer. He advised that this cancer was most likely developing for years, but it was just diagnosed now at a later stage. I saw the guilt and sadness wash over my parents' face, but Dr. Chen assured them that this was a statistical anomaly. Lauren was a young woman who was born and raised in Canada, and the statistics simply did not support her diagnosis. I felt a little less guilty because there was, here was a top oncologist who was reiterating what I thought, that there had to be something happening which is creating a shift in statistical evidence. In late August, Lauren was transferred to the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. Her hospitals, her, or sorry, her symptoms were better managed and she began chemotherapy, full fox, six it's called. Um, I used to sleep at the hospital on occasion, but my mother was there most of the time. My sister did not like the hospital food, but she was grateful to be off the TPN, the total parental nutrition. She would always ask for Tim Hortons, which when her doctor agreed to it, we would give to her. She would watch 90s family sitcoms and Netflix before rest resting. She got used to her life in the hospital and she really fought to get better in order to be home. She was discharged in October, just in time for Canadian Thanksgiving, and she really was excited to eat, but she had a round of chemotherapy just before Thanksgiving, and she was really sick. Her favorite dish was stuffing, but she could only eat a little before feeling nauseous and tired. I still made green long beans and mashed potatoes for her because that's what she asked for. I realized that I was putting a lot of pressure on her and the event because if she could eat like normal, then I could pretend that this wasn't happening. In hindsight, I had to remember that Lauren was going through this journey and I had to take my cues from her and she couldn't fit into my schedule and into my expectations. Lauren had 14 consecutive rounds of chemotherapy and I accompanied her to some of the outpatient appointments. It was very important that we treat this as a normal, everyday occurrence, as this was Lauren's new way of life, and she took it in stride. She was very kind and accommodating to the medical personnel, and this is something that I try to emulate. There's a conscious effort that I think we put forward for people who are tasked with our health care. If we, as patients, are nicer or more amenable, then the medical professionals will care, which they do, but we just think that they'll care even more. Um, it was overwhelming for me to keep my emotions at bay as I tried to be as serene as possible and as calm as possible in the room while my fear and grief were swirling in my mind and my body. There were many days and nights that I cried alone in the comfort of my apartment because I didn't want to affect my sister or my family. 
While in Lauren's hospital room or beside her during chemotherapy, I try not to say anything controversial and to stay as comforting as possible to my sister. We talked about general topics of conversation and what was going on in the city. Through one of my friends who was a caregiver to his brother, he advised that now is the time to live with your sister instead of waiting for her to die. This is a thought that I had with me throughout my journey with Lauren. I tried to be a person by her side as opposed to someone directing her time. I tried to not judge the other people in my family because they all had their roles to play and they were all coping in their own ways. I try not to look back at Lauren's past medical history. For years, Lauren experienced nauseousness in the morning and she was told that she was nervous or that she had an infection that could be treated with antibiotics. From the moment that Lauren was diagnosed, I wanted to be there for her, to fight alongside her, and to research as much as I could to help my parents and my sister. Lauren fought very valiantly, but she lost her battle on May 7th of this year. She was able to turn 29 on her 29th birthday, uh, which was the 29th of January, which was her champagne birthday. Losing a sibling to stomach cancer is not easy. Stomach cancer is a very grotesque disease to watch, and it is quite painful for the patient. For me, I was in awe of Lauren's determination to keep others in mind. The doctors and nurses would ask Lauren how she was, and she would always answer, I'm fine, how are you? Uh, it was a beautiful testament to her character. However, I had to remind her that they were not only asking her the question to be conversational, but it did have real consequences because they wanted to determine her pain medication. I try not to be adversarial with Lauren, but to explain why certain situations were happening. I didn't know what it was like to be a cancer patient, but I did know how to control the narrative when doctors and nurses used complicated medical jargon. I wasn't afraid to ask questions or to take notes. From the advice of my friends and colleagues, I learned that caregivers can talk about their feelings as much as possible. You have permission to be vulnerable and to take advantage of the resources around you. I allowed myself to live with my loved one, Lauren, during her cancer journey. Your loved one knows their own body. Feel free to take your cues from them. From Lauren, I've learned to be kind, even in the worst time of your life, because your kindness will live on in others. And I encourage everyone, in the face of their worst challenge, to be kind. I'm grateful to all of you for allowing me to share my journey as a caregiver. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to thank Anita for that incredibly courageous and powerful. Um, sorry, I'm really choked up. Um, and the Chinois are such an incredible family. We met them after, uh, after Lauren's death, and they have become so much a part of what my gut feeling does. I often rely on Yvonne to speak to, um, to other uh, parents who have lost children. Anita's been amazing uh, in helping as well and providing support. So it is so essential that we understand what the caretakers go through, and that's part of what my gut feeling does. Um, and to understand that the caretakers have so much that they deal with just as much as the patients. Um, so again, thank you so much. I don't know if we had one or two questions, and if not, we'll, we'll leave them to the, to the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Maureen Weaver. 
and Maureen is the spiritual care professional to the critical care program at Toronto Western Hospital and is a specialist with the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care. She holds a BA in psychology from the University of Waterloo, a master of divinity from McMaster University, and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, and I am actually so thrilled to have Maureen speak here um, because we always speak about the spirituality that we need to deal with when we're going through a diagnosis such as gastric cancer. Maureen? Thank you so much for the opportunity and the honor to be here today, to hear your stories and to hear the sharing and the caring that has uh, been part of this experience. I know I'm the last person before lunch, so it's kind of like preaching on Super Bowl Sunday. Everybody wants you to, you know, make your point and pray for their team. So uh, we'll try and uh, keep it moving. So our first question I thought I would answer uh, for people... is what is a spiritual care practitioner? Um, many people going through uh, the types of journeys that you have talked about may not realize that in most hospitals where you receive care, that you would have access to spiritual care. How many people knew that? A few. Okay, great. Um, and it may not have occurred to you uh, what our training is or um, how you can access us. So we are master's level trained to help people find what is meaningful to them during times of crisis and illness. Many are registered psychotherapists in the province of Ontario and we integrate spirituality into the care of patients and their families. We believe that everyone is spiritual, whether that is a belief in a higher power or expressing yourself through art, a walk in the park, running a triathlon, or the belief that we all have that, all, that all we have is the here and now, and we need to make the most of it. And we often sit with some of the very challenging questions. What does it mean to have stomach cancer? What does it do to your social life when farting, diarrhea, burping, special diets, or no food are part of your existence? Do you want to talk about how it affects your sense of self, your sexuality, your relationships? What's it like to face your own death or the death of your loved one? And sometimes we talk about what's normal. One patient that I remember in particular lamented that all people talked about was her cancer. How are you felt like a deep, dark dive into her cancer rather than the trite question we throw at one another in passing. And one day I walked in and she was crying and sobbing, and when I asked her what was wrong, she'd had a fight with her teenage son over attendance at a party that she was worried would be filled with alcohol and drugs. It ended with him calling her the usual names and accusations of being uncool, etc. And I burst out, that's amazing, that's wonderful. And she gave me that look like I was crazy, which I get a lot. Um, and I said, you're finally normal. You're not weird because your hair is falling out or uncool because of your diet. You are just a parent. And I said, let me go get some Tim Hortons coffee and we'll put out a tablecloth and we'll talk as moms about raising our kids and the challenges of that. So sometimes in our profession, we talk about what's normal. And in my uh, research and preparation for this uh, talk, I discovered shockingly little compared to other types of cancers, of research in the area of spirituality and religion. Um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here in that sense, but there was one article that made a very profound statement about uh, gastric cancer. And that is that patients with gastric cancer usually cope with pain through, uh, through praying and hoping. And I heard that in uh, a number of the stories that are, were shared this morning. And what is interesting to me is if you look back over many of the cultures and over many of the religions, the gastric area is actually in the stomach and the gut are the seats of wisdom, feelings, intuition, and even more recently in research, we're beginning to talk about the gut as the second brain, 
because it has that much importance. Somehow, culturally, we have lost the importance of all of that. We recognize its spiritual significance actually in our traditional language and expressions. We have gut feelings. When we're hurt, we're kicked in the gut. When we're nervous, we have butterflies in our stomach. We spill our guts is an expression when we overshare too much. Um, and we have guts, we have courage. And that's just to name a few of the idioms. Today, I wanted to bring um, a, a tool that I thought might be helpful. And that is a labyrinth. And I actually brought a labyrinth with me um, that you can use at lunchtime. And to find it, go down the elevators uh, or the staircase that's just off of where the uh, food is. And it takes about five minutes, or you can spend 30 minutes on it, whatever time you would like, and uh, uh, have an experience of it for yourself. There's also some finger labyrinths you can pick up down there and some more information about labyrinths. So I'm going to talk about the labyrinth, and I thought this might be a tool that might help, help develop hope, develop a sense of meaning, and navigate difficult questions and reconnect with that intuitive self that is often disrupted in major illness. And when I say that intuitive self, I heard so many of your stories just this morning where you're saying, I kind of thought there was something wrong, I knew there was something wrong, it didn't sort of feel right, uh, went to the doctors, um, and that's all the intuition that comes through uh, this area of our body. So what is a labyrinth? and what is a maze? Because they're two very different things, and it's the labyrinth I'm going to be referring to. So a labyrinth is an ancient tool used for meditation. There is only one way in and one way out. It is uh, one way into the center and one way out. And moving into that center is uh, a way that we can represent ourselves and dive into that deeper sense of ourselves. A puzzle, on the other hand, some of you may remember these as children. Um, you walk in and you get lost and you get, um, some of them are so high you can't see over them, so you can kind of solve the puzzle. You've seen them also in newspapers. It's a cognitive activity. It's your left brain uh, activity. And when we go to a labyrinth, we can walk a labyrinth and just see what the surface is for you, what surface is for you, or you can walk with an intentional question. They are designed to quiet the mind, recover balance, and encourage insight, innovation, reflection, and even celebration. You can walk in them individually. You can walk them quickly or very, very slowly. And each way that you walk it may give you a slightly different experience of yourself or of uh, some of those questions that you may bring to it. One woman said to me she felt trapped when she walked in. And I said to her, why don't you try walking to the center, and instead of following the path back out, just walk off the labyrinth. And after she did that, she burst into tears, realizing that she had lived a structured life that didn't allow her to follow her dreams. And she be, had become entrapped in the abuse of her childhood. For me, walking as a group allowed me to listen to voices of negative competition that surfaced. When people passed me in the labyrinth, they'd be like, hey, what are you doing passing me? Hey, like, like, you're going too fast. Like, I'm back here. Of course you can pass in the labyrinth. Why am I having road rage on a labyrinth? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because we have all these feelings that well up with us. And when we have a quiet place to listen and reflect to them, then we have an opportunity to listen to our deeper selves. And uh, you may want to walk onto the labyrinth and say, let me reflect on my journey and just see what comes up for you. Or let me reflect on my diagnosis or let me reflect on my treatment or my path with my loved ones um, that I am going. And just allow those thoughts to be. I have argued that the labyrinth is also an archetypal image of both the brain and the stomach. Now, I work on a neural unit, and when I said it was an archetypal image of, um, of the brain, the world-class neurologists and neurosurgeons on my unit look like I'm a little crazy, but they gave me creative license. So for those of you that are uh, world-class in the gastro world, if it doesn't look like a stomach, just give me creative license here. 
So let me suggest that there are four spiritual practices that you can integrate into the use of the labyrinth, whether you're walking the labyrinth or using a finger labyrinth. You can use the finger labyrinth while waiting for appointments or simply if you're just having an anxious moment. And you can, if you are using a finger labyrinth, try also doing it with your non-dominant hand because you're accessing kind of different parts of yourself and your brain when you do that. So what am I suggesting are the four spiritual practices you can integrate into the labyrinth. The first is gratitude. The practice of gratitude has been clinically shown to have many benefits, including longevity, better sleep, deeper relationships, increased resiliency, reduced stress, greater empathy, and a, too, many phys, too many benefits to mention, really. So as you go on to the labyrinth, you could ask, what am I grateful for today? Undertake. Undertake is to develop intentionality. Do what is significant for you. Whether that's driving a TTC vehicle, whether that's meeting with family and friends or preparing uh, a meal, planning something, but do what is significant for you. And that is another question you can ask on the labyrinth. What is significant for me today? Because it can become so overwhelming with tests and information and looking up Dr. Google and hearing all these uh, re uh, test reports and responses and traveling to new places for treatment, sometimes we can forget to ask, what is most significant for me today? Trust your gut, right? Trust your gut, your gut feeling. What is my gut telling me? Walk onto the labyrinth and just say, what is my gut feeling today? What is my gut telling me? How is my feelings and what's coming up for me as I'm walking the labyrinth and just paying attention and walking slowly or maybe even walking quickly? What is my gut telling me? Learn to listen to that gut because it's, it's one of the best tools that we have as we navigate life. Sleep with bread. Now this is a concept um, that came out of uh, a book called Sleeping with Bread, Holding What Gives, Gives You Life. During World War II, children who were evacuated from England and had been starving and orphaned had difficulty sleeping because they were afraid that they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have food when they awakened in the morning. So each child was given a piece of bread so that they could go to sleep in peace. And this is what the ancient practice of the examine is based on. At the end of the day, we take a moment and we ask ourselves two questions. What gives me life and energy or hope? And what takes it away? And you can uh, adjust this question to whatever language kind of works for you. Um, it might be, what, get, what is light for me? What is darkness? What makes me happiest? What makes me sad? Today, what, I, what am I most grateful for? What am I least grateful for? What, am, what made me feel most alive? What drained me of energy? So whatever question you come up with that is sort of uh, diametrically opposite in your mind, that is the question you want to sit with. And you can do this practice at the end of the day, at the end of a week, at the end of this conference, gave me hope, what gave me energy, and what scared me, or what, uh, what took away my energy. I had a colleague who, had, who was very well off, and he traveled a lot with his children to Europe, and to um, uh, Disney World, and all the places that we think children want to go. And he used this question around the age of eight to 10, when his children were, and he said, you know, looking back, what was the best times that we've had as a family? And the kids said, when we wrestled dad on the floor of the living room. And he was like, oh my goodness, I've been spending all this money taking these kids all over the planet. And for them, they felt most connected on the floor in the living room, wrestling with dad, because that's when, you know, they weren't worried about travel arrangements or money or trying to get to the right restaurant. They were just present to each other. And from age eight to 10 to 18 to 20, his choices were very different. Because sometimes when you do these practices, you're very surprised at when you reflect what gave you energy, listening to that gut and what took it away. 
So as you can see, it spells guts on the way down, just to help you remember some of um, uh, what some of these practices. So that is the book that uh, uh, is, looks like a children's book, but actually has uh, uh, a really kind of excellent way of, of uh, examining that practice. So I just want to close uh, with uh, giving you some idea where to look for labyrinths, because I myself, when I was Googling it, realized I walked past one. I just moved about a year and a half ago. I walked past one every day for a year and a half and didn't realize it was there. It was actually uh, painted on to the surface of a children's water park. But in, in between uh, the various spray nozzles, there was a labyrinth there. Um, but uh, for those of you that are watching online, um, you can, if you Google labyrinth in whichever city you're in, chances are you will find a website and a community that practices walking at the labyrinth. And there is a worldwide labyrinth locator as well. Um, so uh, I just want to close, because one of the things I like to do is sing to my patients, sing in my practice. And so I just want to bless you and say, walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Thank you for listening. I don't know if there's questions. Well, thank you for your time and attention, and I'm around over lunch, so please feel free to, as I say to my staff and patients, just trip me in the hall, and I'm happy to, to speak further. Thank you. Oh, Mo, actually don't go too far. It's time for our second panel. So I'd like to invite all our speakers. So Dr. Hamilton, I'd also like to invite uh, Anita, uh, Mo, uh, Dr. Coburn, Dr. Brar, if you guys would also like to come and weigh in. Uh, Dr. Coburn and Dr. Brar are both surgical oncologists. Uh, uh, Dr. Coburn is at Sunnybrook and Dr. Brar is at Mount Sinai. Uh, so we'll start with questions from the audience. My question goes out to the gentleman from Vancouver. Sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, why is hyperthermia, uh, hyperthermia, hyperthermia? It's dangerous. Um, is that the local that they call in Europe? They say a local chemotherapy. Is that the same than hyperthermia? That they localize, like let's say the organ, and they put the chemo in there, a warm chemo. Is that what you say about hyperthermia? This one, okay. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe I'll try and clarify it and hopefully I'll answer the question that you're asking. So the chemotherapy that is delivered is hyperthermic, which means slightly above normal body temperature, usually around 41 degrees. And our normal body temperature is about 37. So when that is being delivered in the operating room, um, we have some methods to sort of actually lower a patient's body temperature. So when it's delivered, the temperature of the patient actually doesn't get very high. But on the inside of the abdomen, it is hot. It's at about 41, which is like a very high fever, but the patient doesn't itself have that. So hopefully that answers the hyperthermic portion of the acronym, okay? It just, it just helps with um, 
the effectiveness of the drug. Um, and probably the term that I would use is it's, I would call it a regional treatment rather than localized. It is localized to the abdomen and pelvis, but we consider it a regional chemotherapy because um, it's just attacking this area and, and these very, very thin surfaces that it penetrates versus when you get like IV chemotherapy, we think that's a systemic like head to toe throughout your bloodstream type of chemotherapy, okay? Dr. Hamilton, you spoke, or you mentioned a few times um, that HIPEC would be given for a very select patient. Could you give us a sense of what a very select patient looks like? Uh, <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it depends a little bit. I mean, what we were talking about earlier is, is those different stages uh, that it could potentially be used at. Um, when most people are talking about it, they're thinking about patients that do have metastatic spread to the peritoneum. Um, so I guess the very selective patient that I would imagine um, is a younger patient um, that's otherwise very, very healthy, um, has undergone chemotherapy and has had a very good response, um, and within the abdomen has very, very limited amount of disease, and that might be someone, depending on the specific motivations of the patient, that could be evaluated if this might be a good treatment for that individual. Um, so I have a question for both Dr. Barr and Dr. Coburn. So I don't, I have not heard that HIPEC is being done here in Ontario, um, so I was just wondering why is there a possibility? Is it just not felt? Or, and is BC just the only province in Canada that, that is actually doing it? So um, I'll let Dr. Coburn talk about why we don't have it, but it's not the only place in Canada. So uh, there are patients who've had uh, high for gastric cancer in Alberta, specifically in Calgary, uh, in Montreal at Maisonneuve Rosemont Hospital, and uh, in Halifax at Dalhousie. Um, again, you know, a small number. All these centers have done it for a small number of people, uh, so it's not anywhere in North America or the world commonly done for lots of patients. So, uh, and you know, one of the studies that. Dr. Hamilton put up was 68 patients in China. So stomach cancer is the fifth most common cancer worldwide. Um, and you can think how many thousands of patients that means per year. And they found a study where they did 68 in the East. So this, this is a treatment that we have hopefully going to identify some patients that we can use to treat, but it's a narrow focus. We, you know, it's, it's one tool, potentially, but, you know, I think it's, it's for a specific group of people, so. Okay, so I get the, the tough part. Um, <laughs> so I think there's been a lot of questions about why certain things are offered and why certain things are not offered. And I think when Bilal was speaking, he was coming from a UK perspective, and we have some Americans here, and I think each of the groups comes from a different perspective. So I'll give my disclaimer, since I don't have a slide. Uh, I'm a surgeon at Sunnybrook. Um, surgery is not very regulated, per se, uh, and I also work with Cancer Care Ontario, and I don't work on the regulation side. I work on the patient outcome side, but you know, when you um, when you think as a group or an entity, uh, like if you're the UK or you're Ontario or you're BC, about what you're going to offer, I think those groups um, really try to look hard at the evidence. And I think Dr. Hamilton gave a great overview of the evidence and. It's not there. Um, so I, I think that's the problem with offering something like this. Like I think the program here in Ontario, which is established at Mount Sinai, and uh, there was a lot of thought that went into it, and there was a lot of review of the evidence. And if you look at the evidence for ovarian cancer, it's there. If you look at the evidence for appendiceal cancer, it's there. If you look at the evidence for gastric cancer, it's not there. Um, so then what can we do about that? Well, we can build things, like Bilal was speaking about, to show the evidence. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, turn to Teresa and say, uh, this is all about money, right? Why do people do breast cancer research? Because that's where the money is. And, and you do 
prostate cancer research because that's where the money is. And so recently there was a grant and um, we looked at the grant and we said, well, that's a big grant, it's $2 million. And Teresa called us up and said, guys, this is a $2 million grant. Get a team assembled, get, get together and do something. And we put a grant in for that and I thought it was a really good grant. Um, turns out there were 50 other teams across North America that put in grants for this $2 million. Um, but they weren't, a lot of those teams weren't assembled before this grant came about. Gastric cancer has either the lowest funding rate or the next to lowest funding rate in every study that you look at. And so if we want some of these things, if we want immunotherapy, uh, for gastric cancer, I think we have to get together as entities and push for funding and write letters to CHR, CIHR or CCS and say, why, why don't we have that? And so, you know, I think the Stand Up to Cancer grant was great because people follow the money, researchers follow the money, and this group and our group can come together and, and work on that. Um, and then we can offer those programs because then we would have the evidence. I just wanted to say that in the United States, there is only one hospital that I know of that will do HIPIC, and it will do HIPIC un under a very, very strict circumstance. But there's only one for as, gastric, for as, gastric. As it should, because as it was, Dr. Hamilton went through the data, it, that is a very big surgery, and there are a lot of complications from it. It's very complex, and um, you don't want Sunnybrook to do one, and Mount Sinai to do one, and St. Mike's to do one, and St. Joe's to do one. You want everything to be regionalized to one hospital where there's expertise. So we just have a couple questions online actually related to surgery. And I just have a handful of people asking, this is a two-part question, for stage one stomach cancer, is endoscopic resection an alternative to removal? And similarly, what are the benefits of actually creating a pouch during surgery for a stomach removal? Can I answer the first one and have answer? I can do the second one. one. Yeah. Um, very good questions. I mean, we've focused, or at least my part of the talk was focusing on on quite advanced disease, and we haven't really touched too much on early stage disease. Um, but the answer to the question is yes. For early stage gastric cancer, there is potentially a role for endoscopic treatment and doing stomach preservation. That depends on a number of specific criteria, like size, depth of invasion, other pathologic features. Um, and the way in which it re is removed is also quite important. So um, the answer is yes. And, and usually you would be assessed at a center that is doing the like higher volume endoscopic resections, which there are uh, in Ontario, BC, and in numerous places, um, there are subspecialized care providers for that type of treatment. Um, and uh, for pouch, uh, I'm a recent convert uh, to the pouch. Uh, there was a study that came out in January, which is a meta-analysis, which is a type of study that combines other studies. And sometimes we use it when we're not sure if one or two studies are, are good enough to change practice. And the uh, meta-analysis showed that quality of life and um, uh, weight loss, so less weight loss, uh, was associated with people who had a pouch. Now, the, the, the caveat is they weren't big studies. There was a few of them, but all of them sort of pointed towards the pouch being a, a better option in terms of function, quality of life, and weight loss one or two years after surgery. And so my own new uh, approach is that if you have an advanced stomach cancer, the most important thing is that you have a good surgery that you get through without complications and onto chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy or some other treatment afterwards. And so if a pouch, even though there's no evidence that there might be more complications, leads to a complication and interferes with your ability to get this other treatment, then I think quality of life at two years after surgery isn't a trade-off that we should be aggressively uh, going after if it compromises your initial treatment. So for me, I offer it for patients who have a prophylactic gastrectomy um, and sometimes for patients who have early stomach cancer that won't get any uh, therapy afterwards. And um, I've had two patients that we've done this year uh, who are both young, who both needed a prophylactic gastrectomy for a genetic disorder, and they've both done very well. And 
we haven't really studied it because it's just two patients, but the studies that are out there support it. So there's a lot of hesitation because the surgery is already complicated. It is uh, associated with lots of complications and we want patients to do well. So we get nervous when we change to a new technique that might increase complications. So um, talk to your provider, very few people do it, uh, and the studies might show a benefit, but uh, I think you have to do it very carefully, and you have to be comfortable doing it. And uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital, we do a lot of pouches for other diseases, uh, and the colorectal surgeons help me make the pouch so that when we connect it to the esophagus, it's uh, the best um, reservoir that we can make. So again, it's not the standard of care, though. And then I guess one more question. Uh, in terms of those that have lo or lost someone uh, to stomach cancer, and this is, a, I guess, a, a question to the spiritual care uh, provider and the caregiver, how, how do you cope? How do you find meaning? How do you move on? I know there's no easy answer to that, but perhaps you guys can share some insight. Um, I think that uh, you look... Even though I'm an introvert, which sounds crazy, but I am, um, uh, you have to uh, realize that what you went through was completely, even though I, in my speech, I kept saying, I pretended it was normal, I pretended it was normal, I pretended it was normal. I think after, give yourself permission to say, hey, looking back, that was completely abnormal. And then uh, reconciling that with your day-to-day -day now that that person has passed and sort of putting one foot in front of the other, I think, and then just taking it day by day, um, realizing that that just happened. And I think that also engaging with uh, advocacy groups such as my gut feeling also helped me to have a greater understanding of the science behind uh, this type of cancer and also to um, sort of be at peace to the diagnosis and where um, um, the loss currently stands. I, th I think... Um as many people as there are going through this journey is as many ways as there are to, for people to process their grief. It's a very challenging uh, type of cancer in the sense that, uh, you know, you has, there's not a lot of good news in the diagnosis, but yet there are many people who are survivors and who come to these conferences and offer so much hope. And um, my, I think culturally, we're not given permission to say this isn't normal, and we're not given permission to grieve beyond two or three days, and for many people, the grief is much longer than that. So I would encourage uh, people to reach out, to seek support in the communities, um, to reach out to social workers, spiritual care, the people in the hospitals, your doctors, your nurses, um, that you don't have to go through what you're going through alone, either before or after. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Uh, that concludes our second panel. Now, I don't have a stomach, but something is growling, which is telling me <laughs> that it is lunchtime. So we hope uh, you guys have a chance to interact with uh, A. Uh, Mose Mays, which, uh, as she mentioned, is just uh, downstairs if you take the elevator sorry, labyrinth, <laughs> downstairs at the elevators. Uh, also feel free to uh, interact with uh, all our speakers. They're here uh, to learn from you and also uh, you are here to learn from them. So thank you so much. And a couple of other, sure. just a couple of other things. Um, for those of you, again, living without a stomach, please, if you could, and uh, we have someone who will take a video of you. Let's get our voice out there because that's the only way we're gonna change things. And also, uh, we do have some branded material uh, that is for sale. As you all know, this is a nonprofit, and we do this completely on a volunteer basis. So any help is very much appreciated. And please go and enjoy what is hopefully a nutritious and warm lunch. And we'll be back in about 45 minutes. <laughs>